Women Who Own It podcast spotlights women business owners who are pioneers in their field, setting trends, blazing trails, and creating game-changing innovations. Brought to you by WeBank, the largest certifier of women-owned businesses in the U.S. and a leading advocate for women business owners and entrepreneurs. And me, Allison Maslins. I've been a business owner for the last 35 years. I'm the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of the book, Scale or Fail. So join our bold community of women who built it, grew it, and own it. I'll see you on the show. Welcome to Women Who Own It podcast, brought to you by WeBank, the largest certifier of women-owned businesses. The Women Who Own It podcast is supported by Target, a women-owned corporation. And this show is for women business leaders by women business leaders. And I'm your host, Allison Maslin, founder of Pinnacle Global Network, where we mentor business owners around the world to scale their companies. I am so excited for our guest today, Kanchana. Raman moved all the way from India on her own to pursue her dream of being an entrepreneur. She has been a serial entrepreneur and investor in the ICT industry, starting her first company, Avion, in 1996 in Atlanta, Georgia. Avion has several brands and offices globally and successfully deployed 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G networks in 18 countries. I am so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, really excited about, you know, chatting with you um, on, on this episode. Yeah. So now you have quite a story. You came to the U.S. from India. You were only 21 years old to a whole new, whole, whole new country. And in the 90s, you founded your first company with only $5,000 in savings which has obviously grown a lot since then. And I read that your parents instilled in you that you are a winner. And so how did your upbringing impact your journey ahead? Yeah, I mean, I have to now think back 25 years or even, you know, um, many, many years when I, when I was really young and I came here, sometimes over the years, you forget what was that 21 year old like, right? I mean, you've changed and evolved so much as a person, both in terms of knowledge, experience, and uh, just meeting great people along the way, you know, it shapes who you are, your thinking. So I, sometimes I always think, what was that 21 year old that came here and how was that experience? I don't know, I remember all of it, but um, I come from an academic background. Uh, my dad was a management professor. Um, he came to the US in 1956 uh, to do his PhD. And he came in the Queen Mary many years ago. <laughs> wow. So I, I call my dad the pilgrim. And uh, <laughs> so, but then uh, India got independence around that time. And so he had the strong feeling to go back and serve, um, serve India, serve our country. So I was born and raised over there and I came here, but he had, um, you know, he was very inspired by, by everything United States, right? He was very inspired by the academic um, excellence uh, here. And that's one thing he always told us was, I want you to go abroad and get a degree. And I think it started there, but then, you know, we found, our, we formed roots over here and we continue to work and then become an entrepreneur. Um, so it was always, uh, you know, about excelling in whatever you do. And uh, if you look at my dad's side of the family, everybody was, um, you know, university teachers and lecturers. And my mom's side of the family, everybody was uh, kindergarten teachers, middle school teachers, and they would retire as maybe high school teachers, right? So it's like on both sides of the house, it was all about you know, both sides of the family, it was all about education. So I think it just kind of came naturally. And do you remember the what the experience was like when you came to uh, the United States, starting your own business, you know, making that decision that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? So, you know, I was, uh, this was 1996, and I had a couple years of work experience, and I was a um, um, a mother at that time, my daughter was one and a half and my, I was six months pregnant with my son. 
And I used to read this magazine called Network World that came from the Valley, right? So, you, you know, back in the day, it was all, you know, uh, uh, paper, hard copy. And of course, I still love the hard copy, you know, given a choice, I would rather <laughs> read, read a paperback than read a Kindle or something. But uh, so I used to read this magazine and, you know, that was the dot com and, you know, companies were starting every day and it seems like, you know, you're only reading the good stuff, right? It's like so much of positive news. Everybody's raising money and it seemed like an easy path and there was so much opportunity. So I really didn't didn't know what I was getting into. It was more like, yeah, I know what, what I'm doing. I have the expertise. I have the knowledge. I have, I know what telco is all about. So let me get started. Um, little did I know, if I knew what I knew now, I don't know if I would have started. <laughs> I know. You know what? Um, a lot of times um, CEOs will say that. So it's probably good that we're a little blind to it. Right, right. <laughs> Sometimes, like they say, you know, um, I, I, and again, I think, um, you know, what is surprising is the change and the change in technology, which was not that much in 1996, right? When we said next generation of telecom, it would be like five years. But today, when you say next generation of telecom, you're probably talking 12 months, right? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so just the rapid changes, right? I think that was what has been the biggest surprise for me. Um, from where I started uh, in 96. But it was fun times, you know, we did um, fax machines, uh, desktops, uh, landline phones. And uh, so I remember um, I came back uh, with my, you know, when I uh, gave birth to my son, I come back from the hospital and I'm checking my laptop just to be, I mean, uh, not desktop to make sure I'm caught up on emails. I'm checking my fax machine. And my mom would always say, you know, every time she heard the fax machine, she would say, I think your business is doing well. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. I love that. You know, I started my first business too, pre-internet. And um, in fact, I used to go door to door uh, for a, a short period of time, uh, you know, getting clients. I had an ad agency and I remember getting the fa a fax machine and we would all just stand over it, staring at it like it was the greatest thing in the world. Um, so crazy. And so um, and speaking of, of your mom, um, I read that your mom taught you or at least said to you, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And I, I love that reminder in business because a lot of business owners get into trouble this way by depending too much on one revenue stream or one market or even one product. Um, what are your thoughts on diversification and how have you done this in your company? So, yes, yeah, so uh, I think all of us can relate to not listening to mom. So I'm one of those that did not really <laughs> listen. <laughs> so oh, my I goodness. Have, I yes. have learned it the hard way. Uh, but, I, you know, it's a constant reminder to diversify. And it's not the easiest thing to do. You know, even today, 80% of our business comes from 20% of our customers. And I, I mm. don't know why it is like that. So, mm. you know, we try to diversify both in terms of uh, services customers and like i said it's a it's a it's a journey that you have to make an effort every day it doesn't come naturally so there have been times when you know i've had a heavy concentration of work with one customer and if there is any problems over there um you know it does hit you really hard and so yeah. i would say in the 25 year period i have done a lot of su such mistakes and learned it the hard way so i in hindsight wish i listened to mom but i did not <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. I get it. It sneaks up on you. And even in on your team, you know, it's interesting because if you have too much responsibility with one person, you know, um, in the company and they leave too. So um, that's something that, you know, we really look at. Do we have enough people under this person? So in case this were to happen, um, you know, you're covered. So, I so think you it, know, in uh, in B school, I learned one thing about they call the Godzilla theory. So basically, in a production line, you have this one machine, and there are so many things dependent on this one machine. And when this one machine does not work, it disrupts the assembly line. So I think that is very similar to what you're talking about. You know, depending on 
one team member, you know, to be this superstar rock star and, you know, everything else is kind of dependent around them. And I think sometimes as entrepreneurs, we make that mistake of becoming that Godzilla as well. Right. So, you, yes. you know, I think it's important to uh, delegate um, and uh, diversify the responsibility as much as possible internally. So even if one or two people are not there, you know, things move smoothly and, it is seamless for your customer in terms of what they're seeing or what they're receiving from us. Yeah, I mean, you real you nailed it. I think it's the biggest struggle for business owners, and this is a lot of the businesses we help support, is letting go, you know? And they get stuck in the weeds of the business um, rather than working on the business, you know? as the visionary and um and i think it really chokes the growth of their business and so you, know, you have over 600 employees is actually that right? we have 1500 employees 1500 oh okay. that was old data then okay um wow and so you know many business owners struggle with building a team having a great culture as their company scales what are some of the challenges you've overcome in this area and what advice do you have for our business women listeners that are building teams i would say the biggest thing that i have learned and practiced uh, is listening right um so when you i think the best way to grow your business um is you know uh, internally is to listen to your team I think, uh, and also get feedback from them because there are so many uh, great ideas out there. And, uh, you know, you're used to doing things a certain way, but when you bring in new people, they bring in new ideas, fresh ideas. So I think it is important to give an opportunity for everybody to give their input into the business and, you know, constantly learn best practices uh, along the way. So for me, it has been about listening and giving everybody an opportunity to be their own entrepreneur in the business. Has it been hard for you at all to let go, you know, and really see these leaders emerge in your company? I think once you um, start working with people and you learn to trust somebody, see, letting go is you know, it is not just about you, right? There are a lot of people dependent on this letting go, right? Your customers, for example, their projects and their trust on us. So when you give the keys to somebody else, you want to be sure that they are equally passionate about delivering what we have promised and equally passionate and committed to your customer success. So I think that's, that is the process of evolution when you work with somebody internally is to be sure that this person can do it. And then I'm, you know, you, you're happy, you're happy to, you know, uh, delegate the responsibility, but again, you have to do your due diligence before delegating the responsibility. Yeah, that's such great advice. Um, when you uh, either look back or even, even recent, who have been some of your biggest role models? In the a lot of them, you know, I, I am easy to get inspired, you know, <laughs> I, or I'm easy to inspire, right? Uh, so I, I get, you know, I just continuously, I always think about who are my role models, but I think sometimes it is, you know, what in the last 25 years, it is, you know, I have looked up and uh, to so many people, learned from so many people, whether it's my customers my own employees. And recently, I'm excited about the startup companies. You know, I really like those owners, how they come out there, the entrepreneurs, how they think differently. And, you know, it is not alone about making money, but about impact. And I think that is, uh, it comes so naturally to, the, to this current generation. You know, so I work with a lot of young entrepreneurs in terms of mentoring. And it is amazing to see how there is set aside in their business to give back. And uh, that is what is the difference I'm seeing now. And I think it's inspiring me hugely to become a better person myself and think about, you know, how can we do more? You know, what is the impact we can create around us? Oh, I love that. And I know that you are big about giving back 
to the community. Can you talk about that a little bit? So, you know, one is, you know, I would say, I, I guess as successful entrepreneurs, all of us give back in terms of money, right? But I also feel like, you know, sharing our time is the most valuable thing. So, more, you know, one of the things I have done in the last 12 years is we started a high school program, a high school entrepreneurship program in partnership with a nonprofit organization called Thai here in Atlanta. So it's actually a global chapter and I've been very active in that. And we have graduated over 300 um, students and we have wow. taught them entrepreneurship. It goes, you know, it goes through the school year. So it's almost a nine month program. And we have also included a lot of inner city uh, students in terms of giving them scholarships to be part of this. And um, I think that's probably the some, you know, has given me so much purpose in life. And I feel like I'm really paying it forward um, in, in a lot of, in, in, in different ways. And I think uh, also the structure, right? You're able, I feel like when you create an impact, it should be measurable, right? For, you know, coming from a technology background and I'm very data driven. So I'm like, okay, we have graduated 300 students and how, what have they done in the last five to 10 years? You know, have they created companies? Have they raised money? Have they created nonprofits? So we have success stories from the students who have graduated. And to me that, you know, when I have that kind of data, I feel like, okay, I'm successful. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. I mean, to open the door of possibility to a young adult that maybe has not seen that, you know, in their, their young life. Um, wow, it's transformative, right? It's a whole new world for them. So that is so beautiful. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. And so if you could, and you've, you've created great success, your, your company is in many countries all over the world you have hundreds of brands i mean you've you've built quite an incredible enterprise and it is very inspiring uh especially for myself as a businesswoman and for those listening if you could boil it down to one or two things what would you say is your secret to success not that it's a secret but you know what is that driver for you so I'm going to share with you another tip from our proprietary method, the scale it method. And today I want to talk to you about alliance of the team, which is the third pillar of the scale it method. I want to talk about hiring. And I'm sure many of you get frustrated sometimes when you're trying to find those right people. So I want to share a method that we use in our company, Pinnacle Global Network, and that we share with our clients. So I call it the rule of three. Now, how many of you have, how many times have you, you've interviewed someone and you're like, yeah, they're the one, and then you hire them on the spot? Well, oftentimes that doesn't end up working out. Sometimes it does. But the thing is, is that you want people to show their true commitment by actually having to work for it a little bit. And so what I recommend is that you do in the rule of three, a minimum of three interviews, because people show up differently in different scenarios. Are they showing up on time? Are they dressed professionally? Uh, is their mood still upbeat in all three of those interviews, right? Then have them interviewed by at least three different people because you want this to work out. You're hoping it's the right person. And sometimes when we want something so badly, we're not looking at the red flags that are flaring, right? So you can have other people that can see from their perspective as well to uh, see if possibly this person is a right fit, okay? Now, if you don't have three other team members or people on your team, you could even have a great client or someone that, even your, your spouse, somebody that really knows you and what you need in the company. The other thing is if this is an in-person interview, I know a lot of times it's uh, virtual these days, I recommend doing it in three different places because again, people show up differently. Are they opening the door for someone? You know, how are like they parking their car and taking up three spots? Like these are things that you can gain insight 
for what they're telling you and not telling you, you know. Uh, and so uh, three different interviews by three different people and three different places, if, if that is possible, in three different locations. And by that time, you know, you can really gain, or gain insight on someone. Now, there is also a saying, hire um, slowly, fire fast. But in the world we live in right now, you kind of have to speed this up. So you don't want to lose someone if they're great. So you, you might want to condense those three interviews even in a week's time period. Okay? I hope that you enjoyed this tip of the scale up method. Secret to success. <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything, there's, there is anything secretive about it. Or like you said, you know, there's no secret to success. It is, you know, perpetual reinvention. So one of the things I, I feel is, you know, at least from the industry where I am, things change very fast around us. And to be able to adapt and scan the industry for what is coming and to be able to align your company, your employees and your teams, um, your products um, to the change. I think that is probably, I would say, and not to be scared of change, right? Um, and not be scared of how things are changing around us. So I've, I've kind of been what you call that fearless leader. I'm like, yeah, let's just go for it. I mean, when you think about us 25 years ago, I mean, what did we have? What kind of tools did we have? But we still did it. It was just sheer hard work, right? That's all we had. But now you have access to technology, access to tools, access to product, access to innovation, access to some great people, right? I work with a lot of universities. We team with PhDs, we team with research scholars. So I, I feel, I, I really enjoy this process. And I say, and I, I feel like being adaptive to change and being fearless is probably, you know, two things. <laughs> yeah, and I, gosh, you touched on so many great points there too. Uh, because here you are 25 years in and you're still so passionate and so motivated. I think a lot of business owners get burned out. You know, what keeps you excited and motivated in your business? I think um, the uh, the technology, right? I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, when I, you know, in the 25 years that when I started, it was all about wireline business. There was no mobile phones to, for the consumer. Right. So when I started, we were working on, um, you know, deploying wireline switches globally. We, we were working in 18 countries in the first two years of being in business. And that's not something we had planned for. But it was just sheer hard work and, you know, aligning with what your customer wants and just doing whatever it takes because you don't want to be replaced. Right. I mean, I think as business owners, we all have the fear of, you know, not wanting to not meet or exceed your customer expectations. So I think coming from there, um, you know, I've been part of this innovation and evolution of the telecom industry. So I've done everything from 2G, uh, the flip phones, 3G, you know, where the data came in and then 4G where we are now. And then the upcoming 5G and the innovations that are going to come with 5G. Uh, so for example, even as a consumer, I get excited, uh, you know, both as a driver and consumer because I work behind the networks and I also get to enjoy being uh, able to use those innovations. For example, when 4G came, there was no Uber and Airbnb, um, you know, so these were apps that came out of 4G. And now they're saying with 5G, there's so much more that's going to benefit the, 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 the mankind, right? And society as a whole, it's going to get better for us. For example, people are talking about autonomous driving. So it was one of these seminars where they were saying, you know, um, uh, the highways, um, cars are like guns on highways. You know, so they kill more people than guns. And if you can automate like what we have today, you know, autonomous driving, intelligent driving. So if those things are going to come to bear with 5G, how exciting is the world going to be? Or even about robotic surgeries, people are talking about 5G, you know, where there's going to be zero latency and you can have robotic surgeries and you could be just like telehealth, right? This is like the next, taking telehealth to the next level. Telehealth today is like, you know, you're in a village, you know, you're having a rash, you're not able to cure it. You know, you could pretty much consult anybody in the world to see what the problem is and get healed. 
Now you could actually do surgeries. You know, somebody at yeah. Emory here could be sitting and performing a surgery in a remote village anywhere in the world. So I'm just excited about, you know, what is to come, right? And I think it's the industry and my customers. I mean, I get my energy from my customers and I get energies from energy from my team. And of course, energy from my kids. I have two young, uh, fresh graduates who are working in the industry and I feel like I get my ideas and inspiration from them every day. And of course, these students that I work with on the entrepreneurial program, I mean, I just love it. I mean, I think this generation is probably the best generation ever because like I said, they talk about impact, they talk about giving back and it's just not about them, right? It's about the world, making the world a better place. Wow. I mean, I can feel your excitement and passion. You just got me all excited. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I love it. You know, I, um, uh, Peter Diamandis, who is the founder of XPRIZE, he spoke at one of my events and he said that kids that, and this was a few years ago, even that, um, five-year-olds, uh, they will not be driving their own car. You know, they won't be dry. You know, we will have autonomous vehicles. And I think a lot of people are afraid of them, but actually, like you said, most of the accidents are human error. So it's actually going to save a lot of lives, even though Absol it's yeah. scary to let go, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things they were talking about is as a mother, you know, would you have your child drive a Uber with an unknown person with a stranger, or would you trust technology and put them in an autonomous vehicle? So yeah. I guess when you think about that, right, yeah. then you're probably, I mean, we rely on technology every day. We are riding on technology. We are standing on technology's shoulders. So why would we shy away from autonomous driving or autonomous cars? Yeah, so fascinating. And I think this, it, or I know, like you said, this is a great time to be an entrepreneur because, you know, here you were and, and built these businesses in all these countries before we before it was easier to do it now you can pretty much have a global company because of the internet it just is a game changer there there really are no rules of course you know you need to be legal but you could you know, let your imagination run wild on the type of business that you can create right now so it definitely is a very very exciting time um and so you know, this is the 25th anniversary of WeBank as well as the, as your business as well. How has been being part of WeBank, this incredible organization, helped you in your business journey? Yeah. So um, WeBank is 25 years old. And, you know, talk about awareness, right? I didn't even know I was a woman-owned business for the first 10 years of being in business. And then my customer um, told me that I need for you to get certified. And then that's when I got certified. And we didn't even have a local council at that time in Georgia. So I think my certificate came from Ohio, I think, uh, the Ohio council or something like that. And I got certified. And for whatever reason, I made it to the board here in Atlanta. Uh, so when they started the local chapter here, I was on the board. And I think the best part about, I, and I think you can relate, to, to it as a woman is, you know, we're not alone in our journey, right? Um, there are the, the sisterhood. I think that to me, that is what I value the most about uh, WeBank is, you know, people are kind, people are nice, and people are willing to share lessons learned, best practices. And it's like a one-stop shop for everything in business, right? Whether you need, I mean, I opened an office in Canada and I actually use the network to get a CPA, to get an attorney, you know, to get a real estate agent. It's crazy. I mean, we have it all. <laughs> and I, I think that's the best part is, you know, the lean in, right? You be there for each other. So that's the, that's the best thing I've enjoyed about WeBank. From a business perspective, I think one of the things is, you know, you're not shooting in the dark. You know, when you're there with people, um, by being certified and by knowing people, there's a certain level of trust and people do business with people they trust. And I think it, it's a springboard where, you know, once you're there, you're meeting somebody, they know you, you know, they know somebody, you know, they know, right. And I, and I think you just build that network and it gets stronger and stronger. And that's what I really um, admire about WeBank. And, and I think as um, 
somebody who's been certified now for a long time, you know, we have this buddy system where you bring in new people who are attending for the first time and, you know, they're starry eyed and they're like, you know, what do we do? Where do we go? And then it's, it's really great to share your experiences with them and tell them, you know, how to benefit from this. And, you know, sometimes not all relationships lead to getting business, but, you know, the, there is so much more you can learn from those relationships um, and also the partnerships with other women businesses. So there are corporates, there are women businesses, and then there is the personal side of sisterhood. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. And I've been a WBE for only four years, but it truly has been transformational for our company. And we have encouraged so many women, so many members in our Pinnacle Global Network, women-owned businesses um, to get certified. And I love what you said about leaning in, because I think it's really important to not just get certified and wait for things to come to you, but actually to get involved, to build relationships, and uh, it can be lonely as a business owner. And so you don't have to do it alone. Um, and so I love that. Yeah, I think, you know, the mental strength, right? I mean, sometimes when you, especially the last two years, when we all have been pretty much by ourselves and, and, and like the famous saying, it could be lonely at the top, you know, to be able to compare notes and again, to know that, you know, you're not alone, right? People, everybody goes through problems, challenges, and how do we come out of it? And I think that is probably the best thing about, you know, being with like-minded people in an organization, being with C-suite, everybody who's been a founder, president, co-founder, investor, entrepreneur, so you meet them all. Yeah, fantastic. Um, what would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever received in your business journey? Uh, <laughs> um, I think integrity and honesty, I, I would say this is probably, um, you know, the two most important things. And uh, also looking at your business, um, I would say, you know, uh, the short-term, long-term strategy. So one of the things I read and I've adapted um, in the business is, you know, the now where they say you look at the business zero to three years and then you defend the core, what we've got, you strengthen what we have and you, you continue um, your business. And then the second is, you know, tomorrow, right? Um, so three to six years, what is emerging? Uh, you know, how do you align with what is what is coming, the future? And then the third thing they say is the day after tomorrow. So it's like five to 10 years, you know, so you're looking at research labs, um, you know, working with universities um, and also um, be able to connect to the customers, you know, real real life problems human machine collaboration, go after digital assistance, you know, read about everything, you know, people are writing about upcoming uh, technology, what is futuristic. So I think those are some of the, you know, advice, both from people and from my own reading, which I do a lot. <laughs> I just love reading all these different magazines. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not somebody who'll pick up a book and, you know, read it for like, you know, four weeks, but I love these articles and magazines that, you know, that are all the time popping up and, you know, I've subscribed to different newsletters and I follow different people and, you know, I, I read these things and I've adapted it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, so, Honesty and integrity, obviously do what you say you're going to do and you build this level of trust. It's so important. Absolutely. Yeah. People you know, buy from people they trust. Yes, you know? exactly. I mean, it's the core of everything. And then also, you know, for those listening, really looking ahead, what's coming? What are some opportunities that you can tap into or prepare for? You know, otherwise businesses get disrupted. If they're not, you know, we, we can't get, we can't rest on, oh, well, that was a good year. So I'm just going to keep doing the same thing, um, which goes back to your perpetual reinvention. I think that's, that's, that is so fantastic. 
Yeah, so yeah. basically, you know, when they talk, when we talk about perpetual reinvention, uh, one is, uh, you know, listen and scan the marketplace for emerging opportunities. I think that's extremely important. And the ability to adapt, right? Um, they, they say, you know, develop an adaptive IQ. I think it's very important because the more number of years you're in business, I think that becomes a challenge. So, you know, to adapt. So I think that is something, you know, you just practice and internalize. And you talked about disrupt. You know, if we don't disrupt ourselves, somebody else will come and disrupt us. So it is extremely important uh, to, you know, innovate constantly. And I think one good way to disrupt is by leveraging technology to automate and to scale the processes. For example, customers are always telling you that, you know, we want to reduce cycle time. We want, uh, we want to bring in innovation and so when you work with Fortune 100 customers, one of the things we have to think is, how do you automate at scale? How do you do everything at scale, right? So you're a nationwide company, then you're a global company. So anything you do that has to be scale that comes with it. So I think those are some of the things I think about when I think about perpetual reinvention that, is, that we have seen in the last 25 years. And I don't even know what we're going to see in the coming years, but I'm excited. <laughs> yes, and I can tell. And and as we wrap up here, what what is your big picture vision? Like, if you think ten years ahead um, for you and and your company, what what is that big vision that you see? I think, I think as a supplier partner um, to our customers, um, you know, um, I I would say that you know, how do we achieve operational excellence, right? That is something I'm always thinking about, operational excellence. And then again, to team with them on co-creation, right? Um, so we have been doing, say, for example, we get a scope of work, which we have been getting, that, that's the kind of, you know, the turnkey work we do. But how do you bring in emerging technologies uh, emerging ideas to your customer projects? How do you curate them for feasibility? And how do you add value to reduce risk? And then again, the cost of innovation for our customers, right? That is another um, you know, uh, data point that we have to constantly um, uh, think about. Um, the other thing is you, know, you have to also um, monitor and look at the uh, behavior of employees and customers, right? How are we doing it ethically, responsibly? So those are things that have, you know, sustainability has become a big thing now. And then um, again, um, I think in the future, you know, think beyond the current, um, what they call the uh, NPS, the net promoter score. So can we think beyond that? So we have presented a lot of these ideas with our customer. And like I said, you know, you constantly are in this co-creation mode with them and trying to bring in um, market intelligence back to your customers. So together we make it a win. So um, that's what I think is big picture vision for us in the next 10 years. Yeah, I love that. And it's great advice. And as we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to leave with our listeners. I just want to say thank you to the leadership at WeBank um, for providing us these opportunities. And I'm again so excited to be back in person for this conference after 2019. Um, I think um, I feel extremely blessed that, you know, we have this opportunity to again, come and meet everybody in person. Like I said, it's all about people. <laughs> and uh, so again, big thank you to the management team, to everybody that has worked in this program. I know there's so much staff being a co-host for uh, the Georgia Women's Business Council. You know, I'm on these weekly calls and I just see the amount of hard work that goes behind the scenes and uh, just grateful to everybody that's part of this journey. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Well. I'm going to see you at the conference. Yes. We will be there. I've got a, um, we're a sponsor and I, I'm flying out from San Diego, several of our mentors um, and uh, going to be speaking there. So I'm excited to see you in person and meet you in person. Thank so, you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. the opportunity and it was nice meeting you and congratulations on all your success in four years. I mean, seems really phenomenal that uh, and then you have this opportunity with uh, WeBank, which is, you know, definitely great promotion. So 
Congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you so, so much. This has really been so, so inspiring. <laughs> and so for those of you listening, if you enjoyed the show and uh, you have not subscribed to the Women Who Own It podcast, please do so. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share a review. We would truly, truly appreciate that. And as a gift, if you are wanting to scale your business and you are so ready, uh, we want to send you a free copy of my Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Scale or Fail. This is our gift to you. You just go to scaleorfail.com forward slash WeBank, W-B-E-N-C, and we'll send it to you free of charge as our gift. And until next time, get out there and elevate yourself because you are worth it. Bye, everybody.